Hello, everyone. I'm generally a loud person, so but hopefully this works with me. Uh, as Mr. Lawrence mentioned, so my, my topic will tr I'll try to make it as multidisciplinary or, or cross-cutting, let's say, through various points of, of Macedonia's past 20 years. You know, the, in the, uh, the title itself, let's say, Macedonia's uh, model or, or, or let's say concept of uh, integration without assimilation um, as a model which we would like to say is very European, uh, would, to many it will sound that it would deal primarily with, with domestic issues primarily uh, in a country as Macedonia, which is of course, uh, as uh, all other countries in the, in the Balkan region are, are multi-ethnic and multi-religious societies. Indeed, this is the case, and I will uh, extensively speak about Macedonia's internal, uh, let's say, situation, its system of, of governance, its path towards independence, but also, as a principle, integration uh, without assimilation, we see it also as a concept uh, which we would like to see the European Union uh, more um, employ, so to say, more diligently when it comes to the enlargement process, and which we see as something uh, very easily forgotten, let's say, in recent years and decades. So to start with, the, with Macedonia's path to full independence, as I can imagine many of you know, the country has become fully independent in 91, before it was a part of a federal unit of the former Yugoslavia. Uh, it was the only republic of the former Yugoslavia which became independent fully, peacefully, without any uh, armed conflicts. And, uh, uh, and from day one of uh, our full sovereignty and independence, uh, the country opted for building a, a civic-based constitution constitution which was fully implementing all international standards uh, in governance, uh, human minority rights, so and so forth. Of course, everyone is, uh, especially diplomats, are there to praise their own country's achievements and constitutions, but in our case, in 91, even the European community at that time, which was assessing uh, the newly uh, fully independent countries of former Yugoslavia's uh, bid to receive recognition by the European community, then the European, afterwards the European Union, was, uh, were subjected to uh, a legal assessment whether their constitution and other legal acts are meeting uh, the, uh, the, the established international standards uh, of the European community, but also broader international standards. Those very standards eventually became known as the Copenhagen criteria for EU membership itself. So even that early, back in 91, we were, let's say, put to the scrutiny, and Macedonia and Slovenia out of the four newly proclaimed independent countries of former Yugoslavia, were the only two which received uh, uh, a positive uh, um, uh, assessment of the European Commission, of this ad hoc body of the presidents of the constitutional courts of, the, of uh, several EU member states, uh, called after the president of the French Constitutional Court. It was called Robert Badinter Group, named after the then president of the French Constitutional Court. So it found that Macedonia's system, and I'll explain what is our system then and to this day, and that of Slovenia was meeting uh, the, the criteria for recognition, but also criteria which eventually became known as the Copenhagen membership criteria for EU membership. What is Macedonia's specific system? So first I'll briefly tell you something about uh, Macedonia's, uh, let's say, internal build-up. From the basic facts, the country is a uh, um, is a small country of uh, 25,000 square kilometers, slightly bigger than Slo Slovenia, smaller than Croatia, comparing with, with uh, the other ex Yugoslav states, has just over 2 million people, of which 65% uh, are ethnic Macedonian, which are uh, of uh, Christian Orthodox uh, uh, faith. The remainder are a mixture of, of other communities, of which the biggest is the ethnic Albanian uh, community, which is 25%. And there are small, smaller minorities, communities which are Serbs, Turks, Roma, and so on and so forth. Um, the country, uh, uh, as it seems obviously, is a multi-ethnic uh, uh, society, but because of the territory being small, and because of the complexity of the of, of the of the build-up of those communities, so we don't have distinct territories where one only one community lives. So there's a very uh, intertwined uh, mix. Uh, we believed, we still believe that there are, and that's a very key notion to our uh, internal politics, and which we believe uh, that is also should be the case with uh, uh, most other, uh, other countries in the region and beyond, that there, are no ter there should be and there cannot be territorial solutions to, uh, to uh, uh, ethnic, religious, or cultural challenges or, or, or issues, simply because those are not uh, feasible uh, in our region, which is uh, too much... Uh, uh, ethnically and religiously uh, mixed. 
uh, but often uh, these are not even practical solutions. Uh, I won't mention names. You, you can imagine the uh, countries where those who try to have territorial solutions to, to such challenges uh, uh, prove to be non-functional and very much costly uh, solutions. So in our case, Macedonia has built up a very specific model of, of organizing society. The country is a unitary state. So there's only two tiers of, of governance, central government and a municipality, municipalities, which have very extensive uh, uh, rights uh, in fiscal issues, taxation, education, everything is being regulated on the, on, the, on, the, on the lowest possible level. So kind of a subsidiarity level, so to say, uh, which we have at the EU level, but we have internally, so to say. Uh, which means that uh, all non-majority communities, we are not even using the term minority communities in the country, we say non-majority communities uh, on the municipal level uh, uh, exercise uh, the outright uh, governance uh, to the fullest from taxation to linguistic rights. Uh, the, uh, all, uh, official, uh, all languages which are spoken by more than 25% of the population at national level or at the level of municipality are also official in addition to the uh, to the official language of the country, which is Macedonian. So on the national level, those communities, in this case the Albanian community, have their language uh, uh, in a way official in all documents of the government, uh, courts, uh, so on and so forth, but also on the level of municipalities. Sometimes, uh, you know, it's the other way around. There are Macedonians who are a minority. The languages of the other communities are also official if it's above 20% 20, uh, 20 of the uh, population. But what is very specific is not about linguistic rights, which are the case in many other countries, is the decision-making process on central but also on municipal level, uh, which is uh, that uh, all, on national level, all key laws in the country which pertain to the specific cultural, linguistic, educational rights, but even other key laws in the country, uh, not only need to receive the uh, constitutionally prescribed majority of, uh, in, the, in the parliament, so sometimes a simple majority, sometimes a two-thirds majority, but also the majority of, of members of parliament which come from the non-majority minority communities have to vote in favor. By this we, we, we have avoided the risk of majoritization of, 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 uh, of decision making, especially for key uh, laws and regulations, so not for all legislation, otherwise we would have a stalemate uh, in the legislative process. In the same time we have the same principle employed on a municipal level. So in a municipality for key sensitive decisions which pertain to education, naming of streets, you name it, you know. Uh, uh, not only the uh, legally prescribed majority is needed of the number of councillors, but also the majority of municipal councillors which come from the minority communities in that municipality have to vote in favor. So it's kind of a double majority principle, which again uh, uh, we believe uh, is a much better solution than into going into territorial uh, autonomies for, for minorities, uh, as is the case in many other countries. Uh, again, this we believe is also much more cost efficient than into building uh, second uh, level of administration, provincial administrations, cantons, whatever you name it, which are, is the case in other countries, which prove to be very often inefficient, politically speaking, financially speaking. So all of this uh, very specific and it's actually a unique system in many aspects was being uh, uh, built up on in the last 30 years and it's worth uh, bearing in mind that uh, uh, this build-up was happening in the most uh, challenging times in the Balkan Peninsula. So talking about conflicts, which Macedonia luckily but also skillfully avoided, as I have said, the only one from the former Yugoslav uh, states. Uh, but also uh, we had to bear with, uh, uh, with pressures of extraordinary nature, which were specific to Macedonia. Uh, not unique, but uh, some were specific, but one was unique, and I'll come back to that later. First was that uh, Macedonia had to bear with, uh, you know, the economic embargo on Serbia, which uh, was on the regime of Milosevic, which we had to follow through, and Serbia was and still is our one of our biggest economic partners. Not to mention that trade uh, has happened always. In most cases, transit of, of all of our exports and imports was going via Serbia, so there was a complete seal off of the border on the north for about six, seven years which was completely deteriorating the economic situation in the country. And on top of it, in the southern part of the, uh, on our southern borders, we also had, uh, and this is the unique, extraordinary, uh, let's say, situation, which goes in political aspects to this day. Uh, Greece has been also blocking Macedonia's borders on a bilateral level. 
and this is going to be my second part of the presentation uh, about the name of the country, which many of you, have, I can imagine, has heard. We have this very, I would say, exotic, uh, unusual problem, or Greece has a, this problem with us about the name of the country, which has uh, very much undermining, uh, and it's an understatement, undermining. It's a very mild word to use, but I'll go with that. For the past 20 years, our, uh, our establishment on the international uh, stage as a, as a sovereign country, first our recognition as an independent country was delayed, and there was a very crucial delay in the midst of all these conflicts around us, us being the only peaceful country in the region. Our, uh, nevertheless, our, uh, our recognition was delayed by four or five years, although, coming back to my uh, earlier part of the presentation, the European community, the EU itself, assessed that only Macedonia and Slovenia meet the criteria for recognition, but uh, Greece uh, has vetoed uh, the EU uh, recognizing Macedonia then, and to this day they are blocking our entry to the European Union and NATO. So at that time they even went a step uh, further than, than just blocking us politically, but even sealing off the, the southern border, which was the second access to international markets, namely the port of Thessaloniki. Uh, the second biggest city in Greece, uh, which was also our gateway to international markets. So that's why I think uh, uh, it should be worth underlining that in such a demanding context, conflicts in the former Yugoslavia, we had, uh, we had uh, the potential of eventually even uh, Milosevic turning down on Macedonia at that time when there were the conflicts in Bosnia and Croatia. Nevertheless, we managed to, to, to proclaim independence peacefully, and on top of it, us, as pretty much everyone else in the region, being a multi-ethnic society, which by itself is a challenge, uh, have to bear with these other uh, uh, extraordinary, uh, let's say, uh, challenges and blockades. And not to mention on top of it, as was the case also with Hungary, we had to also reconstruct and adapt uh, the planned economy of the previous times to market economy. So too many challenges in the same time state building, and at the same time on top of it uh, blockades of, of an unusual uh, nature some of whom continue to this day, uh, I think makes it that, that our model and our struggle, so to say, should have been more appreciated, let's say, on the, on the European international stage. And this brings me uh, to the other aspect of the notion of, uh, of integration without assimilation vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the EU integration process. And I relate this concept to the EU integration process just because of this specificity of Macedonia's case that uh, we are still, and we have been for 20 years, uh, let's say, victims of, of uh, otherwise a very uh, you know, strategic uh, rule of the European Union that uh, key decisions in the EU, including accession of new member states, have to be um, uh, reached by the existing member states by unanimity. So even a single, single member state can veto and block uh, uh, such a decision such as uh, enlargement. So Macedonia has been, uh, let's say, a victim of, of, of this rule for, for almost two decades, again, because of Greece's uh, blockade of Macedonia on the name issue. And Macedonia insists that uh, my country being called Macedonia, although it was called as such for, as a constituent part of Yugoslavia, as a federal unit, but we were one of the six uh, states of the federal, Yugosla uh, federal Yugoslav state, which had its own government, parliament, constitution, which for those 60 years was called Macedonia even then, and there were no issues at that time from our southern neighbor. All of a sudden, in 1990, they decided that, uh, that uh, by, uh, because they, in 1988, uh, Greece decided to name officially their northern province also as Macedonia, that if the newly proclaimed uh, independent country on the northern border is also called Macedonia, this should imply territorial uh, ambitions towards uh, the, 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 the province of Macedonia, which was named as such a few years before that uh, as part of Greece, which is an absurd claim, of course, first because there are no grounds for such a claim. No one has ever dared even to think about that, not to mention that it actually is ludicrous to think about tiny Macedonia ever even thinking of invading a NATO member as Greece, which has the second biggest per capita spending uh, on military uh, in, in NATO. But this, but it's a different topic, I don't want to bother you, but we can go if you are more interested. It's a part of an internal dynamic in that country, a political dynamic which translates into their foreign policy in the region. But the problem is uh, that uh, this, we believe, this blockade or misuse of the veto power by one member state in the European Union goes very much against the very basic notion of the, of the EU project, which is 
uh, that, uh, you know, it's a very sometimes uh, it's a fleshy statement to say that we are all united in the diversity and, uh, and, and in this context I see the, my earlier statement that integration without assimilation uh, should be also a key notion when it comes to enlargement because how a country is called is a very basic uh, uh, right uh, which history doesn't know any other precedent where other country is blocking and misusing its own position in a, uh, as a member of an of organization to, uh, to, to, to blackmail uh, other countries uh, joining by uh, demanding that the country should ch change its name. So which goes uh, against the, a very basic notion which is a notion of human uh, rights, uh, the right to a name. The same goes for individual, the same goes for states. Nevertheless, we are involved in a, in a, a 20 year almost uh, long process of uh, negotiations under UN auspices with the, with, the, with the Greek government. So far, this didn't bear any fruits simply because obviously this is a non issue for the other side because the pressure is only on Macedonia side that they want us to adapt, so to say, the name of the country to their wishes, but also on top of that. Uh, to change how the language, my language is called Macedonian, is called how the nationality is called, so and so forth. So lots of absurd demands which have no grounds in international law, which have no grounds in human rights practice, so and so forth. But uh, obviously this is not an issue of urgency for them. And the problem is because uh, the European Union being very much involved into uh, other, obviously, more important issues such as the financial crisis, the pressure even on, on, on Greece is not on the required level. So. Going back to the region as such, and also Macedonia, all of it being uh, uh, a multi-ethnic uh, region, multi-religious region, and there lots of, has been lots of uh, conflict in situations in the past 20 years, lots of uh, a very dynamic uh, ethnic agenda in the region. You saw the countries which were bursting, let's say, in, uh, in ethnic and religious conflicts. If there's one consensus among those who have uh, differences of opinion or differences of agendas in the region, uh, within countries or between countries, that is the EU integration process, which is a common, let's say, factor uh, or common uh, goal for all of the countries, but also for all of the different groups within a society. So that's why, uh, unfortunately, due to the EU, as I've said before, very much involved with very obvious uh, uh, crisis uh, situations, such as the financial crisis, Somehow, uh, the EU itself ha has easily forgotten the original, uh, let's say, idea of the, of the EU project, which was a peacemaking process, uh, project. Just a few days ago, I believe, uh, there was the 50th anniversary of the LEC uh, agreement between Germany and, and, uh, and France, I'm talking about countries which had quite a problem just a few years before they signed the agreement, uh, the Second World War and previous wars. Nevertheless, there was a willingness to overcome those differences and then what eventually become the EU. Uh, it was established in those uh, early days after the Second World War. So we believe that the EU process and the EU project itself uh, has lost, uh, you know, the attention which it needs and it should have. That was primarily a peace project and eventually, of course, everything comes along, such as the economic aspects, the social aspects, uh, free movement of goods and people and so on and so forth. And my country, especially with its own complexities, which I have earlier explained, uh, because of the very uh, challenging region in, in which my country is, is located, uh, we are very vocal, uh, let's say, supporters and, and, and lobbies for uh, bigger understanding in Brussels and other major capitals uh, that, the, that the EU integration process should not uh, fall prey to, um, uh, to such, uh, na let's say, nationalistic even, I would say, uh, policies of countries which are misusing their position to block other countries. Um, this won't change. We have to be realistic. Uh, the EU, how the EU is functioning, especially uh, on, when it comes to veto power, won't change because of the financial crisis, to name one uh, example. But uh, we hope that with the support of the European Commission, you know, that's the technical side of the EU, or more expert-based, uh, which is a very strong uh, proponent of, of the EU enlargement process in the region, including my country, combined with political pressures of friendly countries who, which understand uh, the importance of this process not to stop and to continue. Hungary is one of those because of its own very specific uh, uh, knowledge uh, and of course interest uh, in, the, in Southeastern Europe. We hope that, uh, that as the financial crisis will be slowly overcome, then the focus will, will soon return uh, back on, uh, on, uh, on, on, the, on, on the Balkan region, which uh, not only uh, 
it needs the EU because of for final stabilization of the region of the societies we all live in. But also, uh, you know, it might, might uh, sound a bit cheesy to say that also the EU needs the Balkans, and I'll say why, but actually it's true, simply because of, not only because of the size of the market, which might not be good, but because of the strategic location of the, of, of the Balkan Peninsula vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, other emerging economies uh, which are having a much faster pace of development in Asia, Turkey on the doorstep of the Balkans, not to mention Northern Africa is not very far away. So if the EU doesn't, let's say, sober up, maybe it's a harsh word to say when it comes about the importance of the, of the Balkans, I'm afraid that there might be other which might uh, fill the void when it comes to economic policies in the region. And this would very much undermine the competitive edge of the, of the European Union in such a strategic location, um, uh, let's say, in the wider geography. Uh, but also, it, no one should undermine the security uh, aspect of, 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 of uh, towards the EU of, uh, of the Balkan countries joining the European Union. That simply, uh, the Balkans is part of Europe, it goes without saying, it's on the fringes of the borders of the present European Union, and even in between existing member states. The bottom line is, we hope, we believe that, uh, that uh, Macedonia's approach, which I said is integration without assimilation when it comes to regulating the position of various communities with different languages spoken with the religious, as it is in this case in my country, without going into the politically and financially very costly experimenting of, of uh, territorial autonomies, uh, should also be, uh, can also be a remedy to many other similar challenges, not only candidate countries for membership, but even in existing member uh, uh, states of the European Union, which are facing, uh, and we know there are a number of those these days, which are facing uh, challenges which are of, uh, of linguistic or, or, or national uh, uh, nature, because we believe that fragmentation, which is territorial, can only lead uh, to, 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 to crisis situations, which eventually are, are, are politically and financially very costly. And again, to underline, this is also a principle on the larger scale of things within the EU itself and its expansion uh, towards uh, the Balkan countries, that, but also the very core of, uh, of, of, of what the EU is and it should uh, remain uh, to be, that is a peace project. It should uh, very diligently implement its own standards uh, without any discrimination and to find uh, the, the, the way to avoid uh, such blockades or misuse of the veto power because uh, incoming member states, but also existing ones, and Hungary, I know, we know very much uh, is, is uh, is putting an emphasis on, on, uh, on human and minority rights. That's why we believe uh, integration without assimilation is a very key notion in, uh, in, uh, in international affairs and in the EU project, especially when it involves smaller countries which might not have uh, uh, the political weight as, of course, the bigger uh, member states have. So I know I've thrown in lots of, uh, lots of things. One more thing, why I said why the, the Balkan region is also needed for, uh, for, for the EU and I can speak about my country, of course, is the economy, you know. Because of prejudices, but also because of the 90s, which didn't put uh, too much uh, positive marketing, so to say, for, for the countries of my region, uh, the general, let's say, impression is that uh, in most cases, those countries uh, are falling back, uh, falling back when it comes to their economic development. In some aspects, this is the truth. But also, some of those countries, my country included, have been implementing uh, very, uh, very rigorous, stable macroeconomic policies, something which we don't find very often these days in the EU member states. And I can say about my country, our national debt is only 28 uh, percent, our uh, budget deficit and inflation are always in the last five, uh, six years, coming always below 3 percent, around 2 uh, to 3 percent. So, uh, competitively speaking, uh, those countries are not a burden. On the, on the contrary, we talk about countries which uh, managed, speak about my country, managed to uh, develop, uh, uh, notwithstanding all of those pressures which I mentioned earlier, um, uh, especially a macroeconomic uh, you know, environment which, uh, which meets all criteria of the EU, very often even, even beyond what is the current state of play in, in many EU member states, which we see now with the financial crisis. So I finish with the economy, and I always say the economy is which counts, but I can imagine you might have some questions, especially about those other uh, 
more intriguing questions of ethnicity and religion and so on and so forth. So, yeah, thank you very much.